playing games, which really set my attitude about games for life, that I believe games are things that you play face to face on a friendship basis, not just sitting alone in, in a room staring at a computer screen or things like that. That is fine for a short entertainment, but meaningful games are those where you face people and see them and get to know them. Like your application, uh, can you come out for an interview? And I said, uh, oops, I have no money. I cannot come out for the interview. And they said, mm, well, mm, I don't know. I hated to admit it, but I could not knew no one to borrow the money. Uh, my parents lived far away at that time, way out west. And uh, next day, I was very sad, but next day they called back and said, well, we really like your application, <laughs> and we will interview you by phone. And so they set a time, they called back, and they asked me the various questions and things, uh, two or three people on that end of the line. And for some reason, they decided that uh, I was strange, but I was their kind of strange. And uh, they, so they offered me a job. Gary was not tight on what we call rigor in uh, the world of mathematics or, or uh, higher education. Um, he liked to just dream. So it was my job to make all his dreams line up right and add up right and not conflict with one another. And I didn't. I only did a so-so job on that because he would come up with so many different wonderful and crazy things. The internet, uh, digital downloads, PDF formats for multi-platform. All of a sudden, the PCs and the Macintosh can talk to each other. Um, and all of a sudden, it seemed to me, everyone remembered Redbox. Over the people I used to know in the role playing business, some failed and, and are out of the business, and others started as, like me, humble editor in a company, and now they own their own companies and are famous people like Jolly Blackburn or Shane Hensley of Pinnacle Entertainment, uh, who they make uh, the Savage Worlds game, for example. Um, uh, the, uh, Chris Pr Primus, uh, you know, uh, folks like this. Uh, I think that the convention made an excellent choice, uh, honestly, in uh, bringing my co-guest here, because Pathfinder, in America at least, is currently selling better than Wizards of the Coast D&D 4.0. And there's a reason for that. I think they went just a little too far in their designs. I think we're going to see the continued play, though, of old-school games through the OGL clones. Uh, continued success for Pathfinder. I don't see your, Eric, I don't see your slope uh, going down anytime soon. Uh, yeah, yeah, really. Um, uh, Wizards of the Coast made a big mistake with that OGL because it's non-revocable. If, if, if you're not familiar with this term OGL and this principle, essentially uh, a gentleman named uh, Stuart Marshall in Great Britain saw a contract that Wizards of the Coast released which said basically, okay, anybody can write D&D stuff as long as they obey the rules and here's the rules. You don't have to pay us for anything and we promise not to come beat you up anymore. <laughs> Be, uh, before then, if you published D&D something, uh, their, their lawyers would send you a nasty gram and, uh, and maybe take you to court and they got tired of beating up their customers. It's just not been a good business. It's very stupid. But they, in American law, they had to protect their trademark. So they came up with this general solution that you just put this license thing with all the legal language in your product and anybody can write D&D things. And Stuart Marshall in Great Britain in 2004 said, hmm, this doesn't just mean we can write adventures. This means we can rewrite the rules of the game. And so he did. Uh, he took first edition Advanced Dungeons and Dragons and he rewrote everything. So now in copyright law, you must repeat the words exactly to be a copyright infringement. So he rewrote all the words but kept all the same things in there and, and put that OGL, this, this license thing, in. And Wizards of the Coast said, oh, 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 no, no, we, we, we didn't mean that. Uh, stop, stop here. We're sending you a cease and desist letter. And he said, uh, no, I'm not going to cease and desist. Go ahead, Sue. So. And they said, uh, um, oops. <laughs> and so that was the first, they call it a clone, but it's not a clone. It's not exactly the same. All the words are changed, but it's the same game. Uh, sometimes they are called simacrola, using a D and d term, sometimes other things. But um, 
because of this OGL license, all the old versions of D&D &D are still with us. And so my suggestion for a guest would be actually a number of guests, other than Eric. I think it was an excellent choice bringing Eric and representing Pathfinder, which I, th I believe is a clear leader in America, uh, more focused on gamers and what gamers want instead of, frankly, the Wizards of the Coast approach, which is a big company and how much money are we making off of this and what more can we make to print to make you buy it so we can make even more money off of it. They're the guys, and it's not the people at Wizards, to be fair, it's the people upstairs from there at Hasbro, which owns Wizards, who say, you must make this money or else. And the Wizards people are saying, but that's just sucking money out of people. Like, well, do it. We're telling you to do it. You know, just like they told me, shut up, sit down, uh, you know, all that. Um, so it's not really their fault. But I think it was a good move. Looking careful. Look, all of you, look carefully at Pathfinder. It rocks. I mean, it's a really nice game system. If you're not up to adding a new game system that you're comfortable with the game system you've got, I'm sure Eric would echo me. Play the game you like, you know, and the style you like but they offer an excellent option, and Pathfinder game is one of these OGL products. You know, it's D&D 3.5, now it's changed a lot, it's improved a lot, I think. Uh, simplified in many ways, and then added flavor and character on its own. I would suggest that Robocon look at, uh, since Stuart Marshall is so much closer in Great Britain, the, the big cost is across the Atlantic, you know. And he could maybe come part way on his own and you, uh, Robocom pay part of it himself. I am too poor a game designer to be able to afford to come entirely on my own, so I'm very happy that Robocom uh, agreed to bring me. But some of the other pioneers in using the OGL to recreate old game systems and bring it back so we can continue to enjoy them in perpetuity also live in Britain and other accessible places, and maybe looking at some of those, maybe individually they aren't big superstars like, like Eric and the, the Paizo and, and Pathfinder things, but put your head back to, yeah. together there. Uh, maybe they're not so big, but I think we have much to learn from them, and they have much to say, and they have their heads on straight, and they are gamers like we are, you know, not corporate suits looking for the return on investment for the latest outlet. Gamerish thing about our bakery was that uh, you know me, I'm stiff necked and stubborn and uh, all that. So we did not have a normal bakery. Um, my wife came up with these ideas to make everything by hand, everything entirely from scratch, no recipes, no pre made anything, and no margarine, no artificial anything, all butter. Nobody, in many things, nobody knew how to do this anymore. These were things our great-grandmothers used to do, maybe here in Finland a lot closer than that, not so far back. But even today, you want to make a cake, you go to the store, you get a cake mix sort of thing, and we never did anything like that. Some of the best cakes I've ever had in my life were things that my wife managed to invent, going back looking at old, old recipes where they don't say set oven to this temperature, they say use a temperate oven, you know, or, or, or use a, I forget the term, but use this much uh, flour, not, not a measured flour, you know. So she had to translate a lot of very, very old styles and recipes, and the things that have resulted, of course, uh, are just incomparable. You cannot find them all, hardly anywhere, and they make you very big, fat, and ugly, like, <laughs> like I have become. Um, so uh, my fav personal favorite is when she makes a chocolate cream pie because it's authentic uh, chocolate pastry cream, very rich and uh, very fabulous and using all real cream and real good uh, Belgian chocolate perhaps and, and so forth. This, you cannot buy this stuff in America anymore. Everybody, anybody can have a bakery because you just go to the distributor and say, yeah, we like to order this pre-made frozen, uh, the mixes, the, the things that you just thaw it out, put it on the shelf, and some idiot will pay premium price for it, you know. Uh, so you, you don't even have to work hard. You just throw it in the oven, bake it off, it's already made for you. 
we were stiff-necked and stubborn and wouldn't do it that way. And thank, thank goodness, because uh, my wife discovered so many delicious things that had been lost from so many years ago. Unfortunately, you can't make any money doing it that way, uh, which was part of why we had to close down the bakery also. But we were in the resort area, so we did okay for a short time. At, at least people came and threw money for a short time. Some people, it was funny, some people listened to their taste buds, to their mouths, and said, oh, this is special. And so they kept coming back. Every, every, uh, some people would come and just eat breakfast every morning at our bakery for their entire week or two vacation, and then go home and, and do jogging and bicycling and things for two <laughs> months to make it all going. Uh, and then other people would come in and look at it and say, well, like when there's fewer people in the store and say, oh, look at these prices. This must be one of those rip-off joints, you know. And then they'd taste something, but they had stupid taste buds. Uh, <laughs> they would buy something if everybody else bought it. You know, followers, sheep, uh, stupid eaters. Um, but the smart eaters, who could tell? Yeah, uh, those were our best customers.